like to call to order the joint meeting of the Anchorage Assembly School Board. And just for those who don't know, the charter requires that we meet every quarter, and it's a really wonderful thing. Madam Clerk, roll call for the assembly, please. Ms. Gray Jackson. Honored to be here. Mr. Training. Here. Mr. Croft. Ms. Kambosky. Present. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Mr. Rafferty. Here. Mr. Flynn asked to be excused. Mr. Peterson. Present. Mr. Starr. Mr. Steele. Here. Mr. Weber. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, we have some of our secretary. I'll do that. Uh, I'm present. Lisa Snelling is excused. Denny Davis. Here. Pat Higgins. Here. Sarah Marset. Here. Catherine Buckett. Here. And Cameron Presbyterian asked to be excused.
might have seen in the news in regard to the K-9 school district. And they are looking at um, uh, the super and night, the I guess, spoken to each other. And um, they have a new bus system that uh, in Homer, so it's only the South Peninsula, they used to have uh, one start time for all levels of schools in Homer. And the reason being is that they only had one bus service. It was one time, so it could serve all the schools. Uh, in the budget crunch, if you will, with um, transportation money being taken away, they need to go to two tiers so that they can share the buses. So the buses would take the little kids to school and then take the older kids. And currently, they continue to be on one time, but they need to change to two times. And they are looking at um, flip-flopping pretty much what the rest of the state has and having the younger kids go first to school, say at the early time, perhaps at eight, the older kids starting at 9, or 8.30 to 9, 7.30. And uh, they're looking at that move. He believes that that's probably what the community is going to go with. And he said, and then the rest of Kenai, they were looking for FY19 the year after, that they would demonstrate the benefits to kids, being able to sleep in, high school kids' attendance improving, high school kids' achievement improving, and then they would make the switch. So um, those are what the news is out there. We absolutely, there. I haven't found evidence in um, the data in regard to uh, it's better for kids to wake up early. If those data is, aren't there. It's just the conveniences and the routines we've established in our community over time, in our families, in our schools, that would, would affect the change. That's, that's not insurmountable, but it just takes time in connecting with our community uh, to uh, bring about the ideas that they'd like. Um, a small solution that I've um, engaged with in a previous school district was um, high school started at 7:15, uh, and what, um, and then middle school at 8, and they changed their tier. And so uh, school start times were just to not have the biggest impact on community. They were moved 15 minutes one year, 15 minutes the next, so that high school goes 7:45 instead of 7:15. So it was just a slight move, uh, but at the time the community was not willing to totally flip-flop elementary and secondary because, uh, and those are the parents, similar to the parents. So that's where we are, we, we do understand it, it has come up, um, the board has requested administrators to look into it. Um, if this is something that we garner, that this is something our community wants to go to, we can do the work, it'll take some time to bring everybody in, but um, evidence is there, but there are also some challenges in doing it. Thank you, Ms. Corano. For the record, I'd like to recognize that Mr. Starr and Mr. Wilson has joined us, and Mr. Fred has excused them. We are now down to agenda item number C, shared services, and I believe the school district has that item. Ms. Jimmy, do you want to speak on that? Um, yes, and I think you have staff here. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, our board president, um, Ms. Gusky Giesler, asked that uh, we uh, begin the conversation. Uh, that has been a charge, actually, uh, the, in the, the mayor speaking to me, too. And as well to our board president in regard to what are some ideas, what can we do. So our two staff have, have joined and I can uh, begin with uh, Mr. Um, Tom Roth, he's our chief business, uh, chief, chief of operations, and uh, he, can, he can begin and then also if um, city staff are here, it, it's those folks who uh, they have met. So we, we'll start with Mr. Thank, Roth. thank you, Dr. Paramo, and, and through the chair, uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to, to address uh, both the assembly and, and the school board. And I, I just want to start off by saying, um, you know, I, I personally am very optimistic about you know, our relationship, our ongoing relationship as the, as the school district uh, and the municipality. And I'd just like to offer a few comments uh, up front. You know, three, three areas that, that we are working very closely with the municipality right now, uh, which I think have great uh, promise and potential for both the school district and the municipality are in the areas of energy efficiency projects uh, and utilities, uh, specifically with uh, the MLMP. And then just recently we had a conversation with the, uh, the chief fiscal officer and, and we're looking at the potential for combining or sharing services in healthcare. So, so just to kind of give you my, my assessment of, of, of some of the strengths I would offer to, to both the assembly and to the school board. I, I would submit to you the strengths are really in the senior and the mid-level manager areas. I would tell you that, that both organizations have incredibly dedicated and committed and mission-focused employees. And, and I, would, I would submit to you that, that that 
willingness to collaborate and cooperate uh, between both the ASD and the municipality is extremely strong and robust. Um, our mid-level managers are, are meeting daily, quite frankly, and looking for opportunities to work together. Um, I would I would offer from from an improved standpoint one thing that, that we need to do better at the senior level, and, and I submitted uh, this to, to Mike Abbott as a recommendation to Mr. Curtis. At the senior level, we need to prevent or provide more opportunities or create a more deliberate system to meet and to define where those issues are, where those opportunities exist for us to collaborate and to share services. So we're going to do that. In, in my meeting again with Mr. Harris the other day uh, was a part of that. Um, some of the challenges, and you know, I've had an opportunity to talk to both parties last uh, or earlier this year. You know, some of the things that, that we work through, for, for starters, we, we operate on different fiscal years. And that's a challenge when we talk about budgets and how we how we procure things. Um, our IT systems are, are generally different. Um, we have we have labor differences. We we have different unions for our our organized labor. And then, quite frankly, our missions are different. Um, we we have different priorities and responsibilities. So, you know, these are some of the challenges that we work through. What, what I'd like to very briefly highlight, though, coming back to my theme, you know, the optimism uh, and, and, and share this, just to, just to focus on what I, what I think is very positive and some of the accomplishments that we've had, uh, some very recently, as, as most are aware. In the media, it was, it was uh, uh, announced that uh, we now have student access to, to our public libraries, courtesy of the, the municipality. Um, we've combined our channels. We now operate on a single television channel. Um, as I mentioned to you in, in utilities, we're currently in conversations with Mark Johnston at the Municipal Light and Power for the, the district to be a customer to MLMP. The, the benefit to the district is we stand to gain or lower our utility costs significantly, and MLMP has a big customer, a consistent customer for the procurement of their natural gas. Uh, we are in discussions. Uh, with, with MLP also on, on high efficiency condensing boilers for our pools to both lower our costs as well as those for the municipality. Um, we are uh, going to come forward on a uh, recommendation for an energy efficiency program that both the municipality and the district can benefit from and that would involve uh, LED lighting projects, uh, high, high efficiency condensing boilers and just retro commissioning our facilities. We are we do and have uh, in the past and continue to do, we, we, we market our insurance policies and our insurance premiums together. And, and, and our insurance broker opines that that saves both the municipality and the district over 10% in our premiums. For, for the district specifically, that's about $150,000 per year. I would imagine the municipality savings are more comparable. Uh, we bulk purchase items, typically commodities, tires, and those things that both the municipality and the district require, and we lower our costs through that uh, process. Um, we've combined our recruiting for APD. I'm sorry, uh, I'll pause for, for any questions or comments. No, I can wait. You can wait until the Mayor? I'll wait just while. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we have great cooperation through uh, or with our Anchorage Police Department, our Fire Department, uh, the, the Emergency uh, uh, Management Office, Kevin Spillers and his operations. So we're very well integrated with the, the emergency response systems within within the municipality. Um, lastly, just to offer uh, the district, as, as many know, we are transitioning to uh, the acronym is called ALICE. It's a it's a revised system to respond to an armed intruder or attacker in our schools and we've extended to the municipality the potential to uh, <coughs> conduct training, offer training slots um, if it's a, a if it's that's something that the municipality would like to pursue. So again to kind of come back full circle is I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic about the interaction that is happening between the municipality and the district. Uh, there's obviously tremendous room to continue and seek uh, further opportunities to do that, but, but again, it, it is happening, and it is effective and bringing value. So I'll stop there, uh, Madam Chair, and open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Mr. Stark. 
thanks for the perspective of the management level conversations where you're sharing services at the decision making level that has probably some intrigue to me as well that um, facilities managers and those that make decisions cooperatively it's not uncommon for that logistics is another one the fleet of trucks for delivery and distribution that would also be an avenue perhaps to look at maybe you do it better than the city does in terms of uh, just-in-time deliveries uh, the AAP fleet it seems to be all present particularly around scheduled food service so well, that is if that leads me more towards the brass tacks of the shared services definitions i represent the chugaki river area and i would throw out now that we look at the shared services for snow clearing um, you talk about the separate missions but um, our our snow clearing contracts don't adhere similar to the municipalities with the 72 hour rule we're out we're out right away and it's oftentimes frustrating to see the asd fleet and the parallel city services fleet you know, with our city services fleet, for example, at Bruning Middle School, they have to go out of their way to do a three-point turn to get out of there as opposed to doing a bus clearing lane for that. We do have some success stories with the shared services that have just sort of uh, happened because of need, and I don't know that it's a budget line item, it just gets the job done. Our Parks and Rec Department, um, in numerous cases, plows uh, the, the walking uh, paths for um, both uh, Ravenwood School as well as Eagle River High School they're out there first and that's a parks and rec service uh, that just comes to the aid from that so um, you know as that gets quantified into, into dollars I think you you actually could add them up pretty quick but the idea that the missions are different uh, is also there I, I have a caustic side of my personality where at assembly meeting I held up a picture of a street sweeper a brand new one on ASD's property I think they have five or six of them the non-critical service I don't find that the street sweeping criteria gravel pickup in the spring meets the education mission for my definition it's much more of an operations development so I had four or five of the eight by ten glossies as my question flippantly was why does the school district own this uh, sort of thing so I encourage you to drive the, the facilities and look at it there's probably a ten thousand dollar Harley rake if you don't know what a Harley rake is it's for soils preparation tied into landscaping there's a brand new one in ASD's facilities I, I just question how that gets into that mission statement that you so eloquently put that the missions are different. Well then adhere to that to, to a certain degree and say education is this, let us street the you know, sweet street and get the, the, the snow clearing uh, programs under control. But I started the conversation with if you need a test bed, financial test bed or not, I can bring the parties together for the Chugiaki Blue River schools and bring the operations facilities directly. To that conversation and we'll put quantified numbers to it and start this year if you want I, I see no obstacles other than sort of bureaucracy that prevents it the labor contracts I found the labor unions to be very agreeable to the conversation uh, they all want to be paid in job security but um, when they see the mission statement out there uh, that's great so as you need to facilitate and foster those conversations um, look to us to do that but right now I put on the record two Yaki River schools could do it uh, along with, with our with our shared services contracts uh, quickly. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starr, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. You know, these, these are challenging times for us here, and we do not have the luxury of conducting business the way that we have in the past, especially given what's going on at the state level. And to me, there's a simple test that we have to apply when we deal with any kind of shared services. We have to look at what the cumulative savings will be, We're not parsing it between school districts taxpayers write one check. They don't write one to the school district or one to, to the municipality. And so when we can find opportunities to save money, we have to pursue those. Um, and I appreciate that there's ongoing studies and there's concerns about how this is going to happen. It has to happen. And it has to happen fast. And so uh, the, the instructions I've given to Mr. Abbott are to make these things move. We have offered uh, shared service opportunities with fleet maintenance, for example, with risk management, dealing with legal services, for some emergency preparedness and planning that we need to pursue, capital project purchasing. We need also to look at some of the, the school district lands. The municipality has uh, suggested that there's some school district lands that might be uh, better suited to the to development. We need to act now, and we do not have, and I want to underscore this, we do not have the luxury of studying and procrastinating and postponing. Um, and from our side of the table, uh, I've made that very clear, and I would hope that we will find
sensor, they can all be put on a grid. So you can shut them down and bring them up in intensity and duration as long as you want. So I would suggest you give it MLMP. You see, on a joint purchase, in these last 15 years, versus sodium, so you never know. And these will tell you when they're going bad. I appreciate MLMP leading it. I wish you guys were talking about it so we've got one system for it to fly. And through the chair, I might just respond to that. Uh, we, we have had a discussion with uh, Mr. Uh, Johnson and uh, Mr. Agron on that specific topic for the exterior lighting for, for light posts. And, and we are in, in conversations, and, and it looks like a, it's a great opportunity for us to mess with him on that. I really appreciate that. I think we'd be buses for the kids coming out of East High School. We had a system where they could ride the bus from Crete and get home, the city bus. And I'm told the money's not there. We, we uh, I don't know what's going on. So we have uh, transit has student bus passes <coughs> virtually to all high school students for the whole year. Yeah. 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 And that's uh, through the chair just to respond to that. That that is a, a great um, program that, that the municipality has had reinstated uh, for the schools that had it last year, and then expanded the program to include other schools. So. About 15,000 students potentially now could benefit from that offer and, and get into this, this to highlight the relationship between the uh, the director of transportation the municipality, uh, uh, Abul Hamoud, and Chuck Moore, our director of people transportation. Those two gentlemen talk weekly uh, on this on this and other subjects. Thank you. I just want to make sure it's happening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Steele. Oh, a couple of others. The, uh, with regards to the. Uh, Bus pass. I mean, that's uh, that's great news. I think in terms of uh, uh, getting more people in the buses and uh, providing them with the opportunity to to, uh, to ride at different times other than just making the school bus uh, just leaving the school. The problem that I see that needs to be overcome is um, is that it doesn't cover everything, uh, and so you're still going to have to have other routes the efficiency issue, I guess, is what it is. You can have buses rolling well half empty, uh, school buses and that kind of thing, but still have to provide a service, I presume. The uh, um, savings, I think, has to has to also consider uh, the mission. Uh, the uh, the snow plows that uh, Mr. Starr mentioned, uh, when, it, when you get a big dump in the middle of the night, who has a priority? Get the school started, cleaning that up, or, or running down the highways. Uh, that's the biggest issue, it seems to me, in terms of uh, being able to get get the job done. The schools have to do it before the kids arrive, before the cars arrive. Once they arrive, they're in trouble. And, uh, and same thing with the highways. You have to get the highways clean uh, before you get a bunch of cars on. So uh, there's a lot of things that still have to be worked out on that. But in terms of sharing services, we, we definitely. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Mr. Gosby, you sir? Yeah, um, I had written down about the, the people who were in the bus passes for the kids, but I'm delighted to hear it's for all schools because I didn't realize that. It's not that it's quite for all schools. It's, it's uh, East uh, uh, Bartlett, West. then expanded to include West High School, uh, and, and, and a couple of small stellar. Save. Save. I, I don't have the list in front of me. Save and then get but, it but the big ones were, were the high school. Okay, I, I was jumping for joy to see it was all schools. No, we're, we're getting there. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I, think, I think the critical part is what Mr. Steele said, is that some of those schools, South, Service, Chugak, are not on bus as well. Right. And, and I want to clarify for people who are wondering why this is useful, because I've had an experience with the kids uh, telling me that this allows them to after school, if they don't have internet resources at home to go to the library and use those to seek extra help, tutoring, or participate in activities. And so it expands that opportunity for students to do that. And they become familiar with uh, with the people mover uh, system uh, to use potentially later because I've had students who say, oh, well, I have an app. I'll, I'll figure that out right now. I know how to get from such and such on, on Saturday to, yeah, to we have a new school. app, too. A new app. Okay. Yeah. New and better app. So I very, very much appreciate that, and I want to thank the administration on that. Um, and then the other piece I just want to say, it's just a blanket statement, because we've, over the years, we've had um, discussions about shared services a number of times, 
And um, sometimes I've been um, teased by uh, from the a Anchorage School District about uh, being too frugal. But when you talk, when someone I've had the state and said, "Oh, it's only two hundred thousand dollars saving," um, I want to make sure that we aren't putting that to the side because two hundred thousand to me is several teachers, and the mayor talked about how many police officers. And so uh, I really want us, to, even if it's two hundred thousand dollars, I think we need to pursue it. We need we need to be very frugal at these times and find all those savings that we can. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I just wanted to respond to Mayor, Mayor Berkowitz that uh, the board has made it loud and clear to me in regard to uh, shared services and, and the idea that the staff understands we're, we're not just going to talk and admire the problem again, that we actually need to bring outcomes back to both bodies. Um, and that really, um, in a conversation with the mayor earlier, that's what it was about because as uh, the president had mentioned, it, this isn't a new idea, um, but it is new that we are saying we absolutely have to have uh, different outcomes. Um, and uh, when we just say, well, we tried, we tried, that's just, that, um, that's not what it's about. It's not about admiring it and talking about it. It actually is what is the outcome of how we're um, saving uh, money in our city, and whether it's for um, city services or schools, how are we going to uh, keep it up there? Thank you, Dr. Brown. Mr. Higgins? Anyone more? No, I mean, I okay. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, I appreciate both of us, what um, uh, the new superintendent and uh, Mayor Berkowitz said. I think the, this issue has surprised me about how slow, I'm used to government acting slowly, but this issue has seemed so obviously beneficial and yet so difficult to implement um, over, uh, over decades, really. The, um, I'm old enough now in politics to remember the, the years when constituents and even members would complain about seeing state and muni snow plows with their graders up, not grading because, and we'd have to explain back in the 90s, that's because that's a state road or a municipal road, and they always looked at us like, well, that's just stupid. Um, it never was an adequate explanation. And finally, um, under Mayor uh, Begich, that they, they reached a cooperative agreement and, and divided up the city and they renegotiated. And it was insolvable in, until it was done, right? It, was, it seemed like you could never get over union or timing or other issues, and then you found a way to do it, and now it makes so much more sense. You don't have those complaints. They complain about other things now. But, um, but it, and I just know that while there are legitimate difficulties, these things are very solvable. Um, you, you, Maybe I missed it in the list, but the most obvious to me is with all the uh, lawn maintenance, all the grass maintenance, all the mowing capability we have that we have to use in the municipality of summer, it would be so easy to just do the fields that you have. And very little cost. You guys, it's not a high priority for you guys, obviously, in your budget. It's the first thing we cut on the school board for good reason. You don't want to cut a teacher, you cut on it. But it, but it, is sad when it looks horrible, so it's, it's easy to do. Similarly, and talk, the school district manages so many more buildings than the municipality, and it'd be tough for the municipality to say, we manage 100 plus buildings, we can manage 10 more. Um, again, there, I know there are turf and union and other restrictions, but it, it just seems obvious to me that the municipality cutting ASD's grass and possibly ASD managing uh, our buildings, now our buildings, uh, makes sense as well as a lot of the other things that, that you mentioned. Um, one that uh, didn't get mentioned that we talked about the school district that I intend on bringing up the municipality is using our health insurance bargaining power to get better rates from local. We have, you know, growing up here we had a mix of uh, good and bad doctors, I think. You know, sometimes you would want to go to Seattle to get better care. I think we've gotten a much more professional medical coverage up here, but often I think some of the specialists are overcharging compared to, to uh, lower quality rates. And using our power to not, you know, they'll still make a good living, but knock that down some could save us a tremendous amount. And it's the buying power of the muni and the, the unions that are represented by those and the ASD that, that I think can get that done and, and provide real savings. Thank you. Thank you. So there's, the, the healthcare thing is actually, you know, we're talking about knocking off 100 or 200 families, kind of shy. The healthcare cost is, it's a 
second largest budget item is just uh, to pay for the magnitude of the six million dollars a year down to get costs. Uh, we think that there is huge potential there. I know the school district just put out an RFP for doing its own clinic uh, with something that we are actively looking at participating in. If increasing the size of the pool is significant, we're not so sure enough more market force to make a difference, but maybe if we layer in state employees who are here and some of the nonprofits, and these are sort of moving pieces that are happening also at the state level, because if we limit the notion of shared services simply to the school district and the municipality, I think we're giving up some other opportunity. There is one particular thing that maybe the school district can help us with uh, in so far as, uh, in so far as the healthcare issue goes. The state has what they call the 80% rule, uh, which has effectively bumped municipal payments by about $3 million a year. Um, you know, and I'm sure the school district suffers from that as well. We've got the school district's assistance in persuading the state that they, they get away with the 80% rule. 80% of what? You, doc, we, if they're specialty doctors, uh, you pay 80% of the cumulative rate, but there's only a few doctors, you don't want to be the guy who uh, tells your neighbor or your doctor that you're not going to be able to do these types of things the way it tends to drive up inflationary rates. Um, it's not how it's done in any other place. But it, the cost to the municipality alone is about three million bucks a year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Bonkin? Most of the stuff got brought up, no need to go over again, but I do want to um, thank the our internal auditor, which is essential for us. It's uh, one of the first shared services we went to, but it's a, uh, a huge, huge benefit uh, for us to also help us look at saving costs in other areas. Thank you, Ms. Bonkin. Mr. Train? I will just step into the pit. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll go there anyway. Um, building and maintenance is a problem. The a MOA gave that to the school district in 84 by ordinance construction maintenance. We need to take a look at that, as you're saying here, and figure out where it fits best at. Because I don't see the ASD construct any more schools, given the state's funding for us. It's going to be non-existent. But we do need to figure out who can do maintenance better, and then save money while we can. The other thing would be, we do want the school to take a look at health care for our school district employees. I know that right now, the school district Let's say you've got an employee whose health care is taken care of by their spouse's health care. You'd still donate that money to the union. Why? We just got rid of that. Out. Out. In the last contract, it got. So it's, it's not going there anymore? No. It's at least cycling out on the teacher's contract, and yeah, we renegotiated that. We. So when it's completely cycled out, because I'm just wondering how much money you guys were spending doing that. It was being paid for by another insurance company. It's not Sorry, it's not what? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Penny, it is uh, no longer uh, uh, um, placed into an account, but the account is being driven down by paying health care costs. So soon the account will, well, that's the uh, attrition that's happening, is that the account is being mm -hmm. used for health care, uh, but um, there isn't any more dollars being placed into the account. Thank you very much, because that was driving me nuts for a long time. Appreciate it. Anything else, Mr. Chair? No, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to go back to the idea of uh, moving all schools to over to ML and P power, and I, I was wondering, is what how much investment would that take? Because uh, I know many of the schools are currently on two deck electric lines, and uh, how would all how would that work? Does anyone know? Yeah, you got to go with the services. Who's, who's, who's electricity lines run past the school? Right. So if we're going to switch to MLP, do we have to, does MLP have to invest in a bunch of new lines? To Eagle River, it would have to go. Eagle River's too We can keep guessing or we can ask you. So to clarify on this service, the chair, uh, this is the purchase of natural gas, not actually electricity from MLP. We'll still use the same to get MLP electricity services. But as MLMP is producing gas out the inlet, 
uh, we would buy that directly from SIDA through InStar's contract. Just with the savings with Anything else? I really like the wood. But I, I don't recall talking to you about that. Well, Mr. Training was the one here that we were talking about uh, Pat Flynn does reversing on his electric home because he's got solar power. Sure. So the question was could the ASD do that oh, by putting solar power on the school building? Oh, now so that the meter runs backwards. That was you discussing that? Yeah. It was one of the two of you. The guys. middle school, uh, <laughs> the uh, Clark Middle School should always have had solar panels on the side of it or on the roof, one or the other. It's per the aspect is perfect for solar power. And uh, that would be the first one that I would go with it. But, uh, but any that we can do, we should take advantage of. Because they can generate power that feeds into the grid and your meter starts to run yes. backwards after a certain period of time. And they have the school to make save money. Because you've got a lot of buildings, a lot of schools are going to collect. So if you just have some way to look into it, I was just going to comment. I, the, the cap this year for the coaches wouldn't change at all. You still pay a, a fee for the infrastructure and all that in the same group, but the gas is being posted directly from MLP. I, I learned this when I was walking to some house where there was an executive with MLP and they gave me the whole layout. And it was kind of interesting and why it wouldn't, would, it's almost like throwing a switch and the rates go cheaper for ASD. MLP benefits off of it, so it's a win win. I would just say MLP that gas is the best gas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to comment how poor it is. Anything else, Mr. Vigil? No, that was good. Thank you. Mr. Mosky. Uh, thank you. I don't need to say much about it because most of it has already been said, but um, I just want to ask where is the discussion? Because I've been asked a couple times about maybe consolidating schools. Have you guys? Looking at that more. I know Eagle River Brewing is always a hot topic, so just an update would be great. Thank you, Mr. Muskie. Dr. Paramo? Sure. Uh, through the chair to, it's, I know it's Amy. 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 Uh, originally it was set for November, we're moving that up to October, but on there, um, there are some uh, ideas about usage, and of course this is um, of our facilities, um, uh, the areas that have come up uh, to the top that are still being looked at are uh, base schools, if you will, there's uh, quite a bit of capacity there, as well as in Eagle River area to get. Um, so we, once we share with the board the report and what we found out, um, then those decisions will engage the community but those are on um, the radar, if you will, uh, and it's being moved up, I believe, to October 19th rather than that. We were able to uh, get the report back to you. Madam Chair, I, I anticipate this is going to be a, a very hot topic, so um, it would be nice if we could have the phone this agenda for the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Any other comments, Mr. Chair? Just Mr. Mayor? Well, I just want to reiterate uh, the question I had about land issues, the school district land, and there's four parcels. I sat through meetings like this. Who sort of takes ownership of the conversation are, as we share services now? Is ASD going to take a summary of the things we talked about here and give us a working paper on why we can't do it? Mr. Mayor, you seem pretty aggressive to share the services and move forward in that, but I don't see assigned duties thereof. It's you're willing, they're yes, here. Sir. Does somebody come back and give us a status report of why that's not going to work in Eagle River, or we're going to do this? What, what happens next? Well, I, I would, through the chair, uh, what I would hope happens is that we, on a very short timeline, get responses as to what we can do and how long it will take to accomplish any of these potential shared services. We're all coming up on budget times.
yeah. the upcoming two months. Um, and so I would hope that we can have um, Well, I don't want to pontificate, but you're exactly right in the conversation about when the constituent base writes a check. So what I want to know, and I study the budget, Ms. Craig Jackson and I are very good at it from the perspective of if I have to increase the Subversa road clearing budget at the same time I reduce the ASD commitment for plowing snow at Ravenwood or Bruning or Eagle River High School, I'll do it. Mr. Croft's left, but it is very frustrating to see the two fleets cross paths. They're out there at the same time. Mr. Steele, it may not be that they clear it entirely, but they'll get teacher parking done, they'll get the bus lanes, they'll get the sidewalks done, and then they'll come back. They're good at it. And so I think we just have to have the ownership of the conversation so that when budgets come, if I've got to grow the snow clearing budget out in my aspect and reduce it in the other side, the dollars will ultimately net gain for the taxpayer who has to write that single check. And I think it's efficiencies. There's absolutely no efficiencies in two fleets and two drivers and two schedules and two overtimes and heavy snows. And, and so even if we just look better because we're cooperative, there's got to be some savings in there. Get the overtime reduced because we're sharing dump trucks or, you know, it, 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 isn't, it isn't that hard. I mean, I, I guess I'm with Mr. Croft and the frustration is we just got to start doing it. And if that didn't work, then let's, let's stop doing it. But I, I'll start sending pictures back with you and why you're sweep, sweeping your sidewalks and why we're sweeping ours concurrently. Um, you know, and that doesn't even begin to bring in the whole DOT capacity and, and their fleets that are parked. But I've got three of them. I got Parks and Rec, I got Road Clearing, I got DOT, and I got Muni Fleet sitting out there. If that's four, it's a lot of dump trucks, a lot of snow clearing, and we're talking million dollar budgets. They're well over the two hundred thousand dollar mark. But you have to remember the DOT scaling back. Fine. I, I, I will take the capacity, but again, at the end of the day, the users that, that write the checks, uh, I think we'll see a gain if we can cooperatively come together. And let's just got to start somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Stoyer, Mr. Dunbar. Just really quickly, because that's the first I heard of it, about the, the land idea. So I'll go to Mr. Mayor, or perhaps Mr. Was it Mr. Roth or Mr. Ross? Roth. Roth. Okay. If you could comment on that. So you mentioned that parcel next to the Totem Theater, your theater. I'm very familiar with that parcel. I helped clear a abandoned homeless camp out of there. Um, and I would love to see something done with that parcel. So how would that look? Would it be transferred to the municipality? Would it be um, a land swap? What, what are you talking about exactly? I would just venture to say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can we put that on the next agenda or so? Because there's a lot to that. I, I, the parcel you mentioned about the Beach Lake Park has developable land. So, Mr. Dunbar, I can show you offline. If there is four, I've got one that's ready to launch, but it's very complicated. Uh, we can talk about it today, but um, it's pretty big. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Two more quick things. Uh, did, Mr. Mayor, did you say that the gravel pit area was uh, one of those that you thought was on the market? Because we have a couple parcels down there. That and if you look up, there's community land that is of uh, interest to the school district, but we need to move on this. The, the other one uh, that interests me tremendously is uh, a replacement for this building. We spent a lot of money on this building, and if we're closing uh, Central Middle School, some other sites we may want to think about. Certainly with Central, we've got emergency preparedness there at schools on that whole block. And uh, it might not be a bad idea to think about our own building rather than uh, what, we, what we pay for this building. So just get that on the table. Thank you, Mr. Steele. And I have a comment. I, I have to tell you, I'm really, really excited here in this conversation. I'm excited because for over 20 years, I'm a staff assistant in Pat Abbey, who's on the talking about sharing services and nothing ever happens. I really appreciate everybody's comments, but in particular the mayor's comments, because I think that he's serious. And I think, based on what he had to say, that he's going to take the lead um, in bringing this all together, because we really need to do something, and we need to do it now. No we're trying to play around about shared services. This is serious business, and, and we, we have to make things happen. Downstairs, there's about two file cabinets full of stuff about shared services that have been kept over the years. So if anybody wants to look at those files, there may be some things in there that can be helpful. But thank you again for the conversation. The next agenda item is Governor's veto, find that reimbursement. Who'd like to take the lead on that? I just want to preface it and then I'll turn it over to the administration. Um, we had a discussion at our last board meeting about, um, there was a question about uh, ASD having, not having a lobbyist. We didn't have one, I think, since the early 80s. And um, obviously, um, I don't think this is a time to even uh, consider adding uh, expenses to.
to our budget, our strained budget, but um, we thought it might be useful to have a discussion about how we can combine our efforts in uh, going to CUNA to talk about the bond debt reimbursement issue. And uh, maybe it's not a, uh, a full-time employee uh, serving, or an, an employee, a contractor serving as a lobbyist, but maybe that's a shared service that we can do together in getting the message um, that when they ship that bond debt reimbursement to local taxpayers, they haven't reduced the budget. And, uh, they may have reduced their budget, but they haven't reduced the, uh, the cost. Mr. Mayor? Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, in response, absolutely. We, we would be happy to uh, look at ways where we can uh, more useful for uh, what you have working down in Cuba, especially for the mission. For me, if the bond debt issue transcends the budgetary piece of it, and that was the kind of veto that has bigger consequences than just the dollars. The bond, when you make a commitment to pay a bond, there is moral obligation that goes along with it. And treating from that moral obligation uh, on the state's side is incredibly troubling to me. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And then I'd like to defer to the uh, superintendent. Mr. Training, our committee can move forward. Thank you. Steve did. It was terrible because <coughs> in years past, we've always told them, told the taxpayers, don't worry, the state's going to participate. They've got a history of fulfilling their promise. This year, they dropped their promise on the ground and ran away top of it. How do we ever go to the voters again and tell them, oh, the state's going to fund 60%, and the voters going to say, sure, what happened last year? So it really worries me because I don't see us being able to bond. Voters aren't going to approve it. The state went far and gone what they thought they were going to do it by doing this. This is the best that I have. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Don't we get out of here? I guess I would just uh, finish up with the uh, conversation. We have um, identified uh, the, some funds in our, our debt service fund uh, for which we're gonna put towards the 10.8 million, but that is, I think, the, the elephant in the room in regard to the, the full entire payment. Um, in regard to um, the portion for which the state uh, denied the payment, which um, they had paid, you know, they, they took away 25% of the 75% so um, it is 10.8. Uh, we there was a request from the assembly uh, for the unreserved fund balance from from the school district, um, but really that issue I believe is is what was is on the table. Uh, certainly um, working cooperatively and I you know with the uh, I guess the incarceration increase in costs also is another example of the same type of uh, not really um, cutting uh, government but. But not even keeping the borders. Right. Yeah. So um, we are uh, uh, not sure. We have discussions, but that is unresolved at both points of this one. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trainee. Doctor, I want to know what is the fund balance currently of the school district? Because I had one estimate done. It's $129 million on your fund balance, down $12 million from last year. What is the unrestricted? Thank you. 
into account what our what emergency needs we're going to have this year or or even for next year. Thank you, Ms. Clinton. Okay, the next item on the agenda is data dashboard. Looks like we're going to have to change it. Yes, Madam Chair. This was a request. Um, <coughs> sure, these are. The, uh, yeah, we'll have them on there. Um, this was uh, a sharing at the request of uh, the school board to share information that is occurring in our school district. And um, I, I have this presentation. I don't know if I should stand up. Is that clear? Or am I heard okay here? Um, so uh, the data dashboard is basically uh, fulfilling two goals. The one, when I was uh, hired as the superintendent of schools, I did have a serious conversation with the board in regard to what is the lift here? What is it that um, you would like? And of course, uh, student achievement in all aspects of the word, not in a test score, but we want the opportunities for our students um, to increase, to, to build capacity in our kids so that when they leave us, they are able to uh, you know, have access to university uh, training, um, access to work, military, uh, without, uh, if you will, a, a, a ceiling put upon them. So not only that, uh, but they wanted and desired more transparency from administration uh, and from our system uh, to build capacity for the work that we do. So the data dashboard is data that is extant, which means that it's data that's already there. We didn't recreate it. We captured data from D, from internal, um, Right now, attendance and suspensions and test scores are already reported to D. They just lie in different areas. Uh, we captured internal data uh, to be able to place it together uh, into a system, and it was internally built by Mr. Fleckenstein, our, our chief um, in, uh, IT uh, person. And uh, his folks built this uh, with a program called Tableau. Uh, the, it is uh, 10,000 feet. This is not going to identify kids, it doesn't identify teachers. This is to look at trends to see where are we as a school district, and if we are serious about improvement, where do we need to go? Um, another item I just want to share is um, the fable of the elephant, and you may have heard of the elephant and the blind men. Sometimes they say seven blind men, sometimes they say five, and certainly the fable goes where it's an old Indian fable where um, they were blind, so they touched different parts of the elephant, and they couldn't agree uh, that they couldn't figure out what it was um, because somebody had the trunk, somebody had a tusk, somebody had a, a tail, and they did not agree on the type of animal it was. But once they started working cooperatively, seeing a bigger picture, they could then identify uh, the need or what the elephant was. In, in this case, the data needs to be taken as a whole and looked at as a whole. So one piece pulled out, uh, we can make many assumptions, but the goal uh, for the school board is to look at where we are and where we need to go. So um, with that, we've worked with it internally. Internally, it can drill down to less than 10 kids a classroom. And if that's the case, then you could potentially identify those kids. So we fall under FERPA rules, which is um, the Privacy Act of Student Data. And so we, uh, can see that because we are educational professionals and if it's misused, your certificate's taken away. But on the public side, we are in beta testing a public side uh, to where the uh, thresholds for students in the classroom wouldn't be too low. Because it literally, if you've ever <coughs> ordered something online, um, whether it be REI or Nordstrom's, and you just have a few clicks, you know, I want this department, I want, you know, women's clothes, I want this size and this color and this type of clothing. You drill down and then you finally get your answer. This data dashboard works the same way. I want to know about this big picture and then I want to drill it down to see what are the student groups and how are we doing. Um, essentially, with what we've done and the board's asked, we talked about it as a cat let out of the bag. Um, these data are now where we are and the goal is not an I gotcha for staff or not an I gotcha for anyone that I work for, but the only way that we can succeed is if we bring everybody forward. Um, we can't live where we are when we see the data, but um, the data is going to tell us the what, what's out there in our school district, where are we achieving, uh, where are our shortfalls. Um, the next part, and, and these are just, this helps staff understand, it's the so what. So what do we know about that, and what do we think, and what's the next question that leads to the next question so that we can start solving it, which is the now what. 
Again, I'm not one to admire a problem. Um, like shared services, I've heard the chair say for 20 years, even more than that. Uh, I'm actually outcome-based and uh, achievement-based, if you will, so now we need to figure it out once it's out there. And that is the now what are we gonna do? But certainly, um, this has been uh, an aha in our, our schools and um, with our community groups. So this is uh, one picture of what it looks like. There's four different areas, and this is early learning. And um, this is just two years, although you can pull back three, three years because uh, we want to look at trend data. But if you look up at the left-hand side, uh, it really will give the end, how many kids are in the district. And then it moves over to how many then, as I make these clicks about the information I want, what am I looking at? This certainly is early data, and it's in the fall, and I, I, I can't see, oh, it's letter, letter naming fluency. Letter naming fluency. Uh, we know that that is a pre-skill for reading, so this is a, a K-1 data. And uh, these two years, as you can see, what happens, the first one is what happens in the fall, the middle of the year, and the spring. Um, just for these two years, I can pull up the last seven years, and we have had um, data that look identical. So the spring and the spring is identical, meaning we haven't moved the needle. That um, no more than 67% uh, of our kids then leave us ready for that next level. And we know that those key things, if the goal is to get 80 to 85% of students, we can say and look at which schools have more kids getting it. And if we have a 60% average, the mean, we know that some schools are probably upwards of 100 kids ready. And then there's other schools that have about 20 kids ready. That is what's happening in our school district. So we need to take a look at these data and understand um, you know, the root cause is what are we going to do to bring achievement up for all of our students. Um, if you look, another piece of data uh, is high school on track. That means uh, we know information that Fs in a student earning an F in high school is an indicator of being at risk and, and not completing. That is um, national evidence in research. So we created this and, and dropped in the last three years of high school kids who received an F on a report card. Um, the yellow, the blue, and the black up top represent different school years. And what do you notice again? It, it hasn't changed, it stayed the same. One in three students in our school district, and it's unacceptable to me, it's unacceptable to the board, are earning an F, which means one in three are, are then at risk of not completion. And the F, this isn't a message to say don't get Fs. This is a message, this is just an indicator that says what's going on in our classrooms that we need to change, because some students aren't achieving, some students aren't learning as we'd like them to. And so I've had many conversations uh, with teacher groups that says, what, you just want me to don't give up? So I was like, if it was easy as that, that would have already been done. It's about the learning experiences that happen. Um, on the bottom, uh, you know, we can look at the, the map, will tell us where the information is and the hot spots, if you will. Um, but also the colored bars on the bottom, um, and we'll ha have a handout for you as well, but this is going to be public in October. Um, those are the, the uh, core subjects for which those um, data are grabbed. So uh, it gives you the number of Fs in a particular construct or course. So there's language arts, mathematics, science, and so you can go down and down, and you can actually drill down to every single course that we offer from art to PE to health, um, to ROTC, you can uh, capture data about how students are doing. Um, but this just leads you um, to ask a question, and it did us. Um, where are we, where or whom are the students who are making apps? It allows us to drill down. And in our school district, you saw it was about 29%, so nearly one in three but these are our student groups that show a dis, um, discrepancy or um, an educational difference in achievement through our student groups. And so we're beginning to talk about this and to see, uh, let, you know, look at our practices. It's, it's not, um, when these data come back at you like this, it's not a time to look out the window and say, whoa, you know, parents must do this or so-and-so must do this or that kid this. It's this demonstrates a time to look in a mirror 
and say uh, what's happening in our schools and what isn't happening in our schools to allow for achievement for all students to be successful. So uh, that is the data from FY16, which was last school year. So the entire last school year, half of our Alaska Native students did receive um, Aaron F. Um, then you see our other um, items. And, and these are marked, if you heard the word disproportionality data, this demonstrates a disproportionality in achievement in our schools. Um, another qu a question might come from this about, um, which we are allowed to say, so why is this? Um, some other indicators that we know <coughs> lead to success in schools is attendance. Whom are the students who are attending or not? We actually then drill down, we have attendance online so that we can look at attendance with our students, attendance in different school areas, and attendance during certain times of the year. The big drop is November. That's right before Thanksgiving. Yep. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, certainly, and then Mr. Wells. So, uh, and perhaps just on the next slide, but do you, do you collect socioeconomic data as well as you know, household income? And if so, do you do a cross um, with, the, with the racial data? Do a, you know, a regressor analysis that sort of shows which of those is more impactful? Uh, through the chair, yes, we can. And in fact, you'll be able to do it as well because um, socioeconomic is one of the tabs for which you can look rather than just student group. Uh, but I want to let you know that. Um, is it cross reference? Is it cross reference with the racial data? Yes, you can. You can. Yes, you can cross reference anything: boys, girls, um, ethnicity. Uh, you can cross reference socioeconomic. You can cross reference ELL language learners. So, uh, but I want to let you know that uh, it isn't in our school district a poverty issue because we we have students who are not in um, the lower SES socioeconomic status who also still don't achieve. So it's a it's a little bit of both. So when we did the regression analysis, it isn't um, certainly for white and Asian. Actually, that was my question, but it was uh, stated much better than I would have, and the yeah. answer was better than I expected. And, and just so you know, this this uh, has a, a power. So all these drop downs that you see there, uh, you could go back to the app, and you can. And there's five drop downs there, and then you can continue to drop it down. So then I want to look at um, ethnicity, sex, socioeconomic status, first year English language learners at Bartlett. It, it, you can drill down. I mean, it's very, very powerful. But what the beta test now is that we just cannot get a classroom lower than 10 that anyone could drill down to. So the, um, an algorithm is being used on it now to, to block any of those classes that would be. Uh, and again, it's for identification of children because this won't share teachers, nor will it share um, children. It is just going to share school. Ms. Marcet? I'd like to just um, expand on what Dr. Palmo said. Not only is this the first time we've, we've been able to gather this data, but we are also putting together what we have not had, well, I guess we have had it, but not consolidated, a uh, strategic plan. And so what we are starting to put together now through Dr. Paramo and the staff is, okay, we see these, we're kind of trying to figure out the why, but what are we doing to address and how are we measuring that? So those are some new things that you're going to see from the school district that's going to be transparent. You're going to be able to see it. We're putting those together now. So not only do you see our goals, but you're going to see how we're going to address those goals, how we're going to make them happen, and how we're going to measure them. And it's going to be the same thing with these type of challenges that we're looking at. Thank you, Ms. Marcet. Ms. Bostic is there? Yeah, and again, I don't want to steal Dean Asunder, but um, this is an example. When, when the public is going to have access to this information, they too are going to be able to generate questions. Why is this? I mean, you may be looking at this attendance and go, whoa, what happened in November where you had this huge dip last year? And then we have to go back and look at some of the trend data. What, what, was that when we had the big flu uh, uh, epidemic hit here? I, I know a lot of people had the flu shot, but it didn't matter. This was one that was uh, resistant to that flu shot, and, and there was a huge, I, I know uh, many adults were out. So it'd be interesting, talk about shared terms, and it'd be interesting to put employee data information from the muni and uh, the district adept and see if there's any uh, similar trends, particularly with attendance. Okay. But this, this is powerful for, for uh, opening it up and getting questions that maybe we haven't even thought about in the school district. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr., do we have a way to figure out Statewide. That's not reality. So do we, can Through we the chair, that out? Uh, we, we 
can. Uh, we will know how far the data go back and according to when they uh, come into ASC, so we can figure that out. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Okay. So um, if, uh, some of the questions then are asked, well, what about attendance? Are students coming here? And on this end, the longer the bar, the better the data. So um, we look at attendance. This is a goal that who is achieving 90% or better? 80% of our Asian community is achieving 90% or better. Um, so you can take a look at where, wh whom are the kids that are attending school? Um, another uh, question that this really raised for, um, was for, for principals came back and said, this really has a lot to do with our in-school and out-of-school suspension and our grading practice and the availability to make up work. Our teachers shared that with us, that they're sometimes, um, because of policy, held back um, from doing the work. So then you can look at suspensions. Whom in our school district are in and out of school suspended? So basically, essentially, these kids that are missing the instruction that they need to achieve. Um, this, if we take ASD students with behavior offenses, and these are just to demonstrate where we are and where we need to go. So um, if you look at um, behavior offenses, and this is in and out of school, so it means even in, in school suspension, they were taken out of the learning environment. Um, these are our data again, and you can demonstrate the disproportionality in whom the students are. And a disproportionality would be that if whatever makeup that that student has, so white now in our school district is about 48%, I believe, um, your data should match what your percentage is on the people. So when it's disproportionate, uh, that that's when um, you start to ask questions. So the next one is just all three of these items. Again, the orange is a positive data point. The blues are, um, uh, you know, with an F, you don't want the blue line to be long, but you do want the orange line to be long. But this is just a way that we're then questioning and talking to each other. Uh, who are the kids, where are they? But again, in schools, it goes down to what classes? What are we, what are we teaching? How are we teaching it? What time of day are we teaching it? Um, but it's really come back to, uh, Long-standing practices and grading um, and achievement. Uh, when we take a student out in one school, they're allowed to make up the assessment when they're le when they're left, and in another school they're not. So we all know that when you have an F and you earn an F, F represents 60% of this a scale of 100. An A only represents 10%. So if a student receives a 59, that is an F, and that is hard to. If you're only averaging, that's hard to find the mean. New best practices are as, say you were taking a chapter test, if I took a midterm and I made a 59, but by the, and I continued my learning, and by the end of that chapter, I was able to make an 80. Uh, new grading practices are, it's about the outcome. They earn the 80 because they finally understand, allow them to make up the test before that. So there's some practices <coughs> that are best practices out there to talk about, but um, they call zero's killers, that they, they really do drive things down. So um, again, uh, these again are just being looked at. Um, Member Marcet mentioned we do have goals. We have great partnerships with our community in regard to these goals. Um, the goals were, are, are, were defined effectively by the board, and I would say um, our team now has better defined those for the work to be done. They were ineffectively um, uh, described with a target set uh, in the past, and the staff at ASD has really worked on that. And an example of which Mark, Ms. Marset, um, Member Marset mentioned is we're getting very specific. We will increase letter naming fluency by this um, by this time. So we're not only setting the metric, then we're also pulling back with principals and teachers and district office to say what are the inputs, what is the professional development, what do we need to do to achieve that? So we're, we're assisting. I wanna let everyone know it wasn't a matter of not doing hard work. I say our employees work hard. This is a matter of identifying the right work. And data help you do that. They help you identify the right work that needs to be done. Um, it, this is all really for the bigger picture of why are we doing what we're doing. It's to higher achievement. The board wants success in life. Our mission is success in life. And when you do research on life, it's, people talk about why you get an education both at K-12 and secondary, is to have a great life and great job are the two things that come up. And in education, what we need to do is prepare kids to have both of those, and it does take um, education to do that, um, and it takes connections in your school. The new law 
uh, really allows us to redefine ready. Um, we used to have NCLB, uh, if you hear it, it's ESSA now, it's called Every Student Succeeds Act. NCLB was based off of a one test score and that's what your school received, a label. And certainly I've shared over and over again that, you know, um, we all might weigh ourselves, and when we step off that scale, we know that that one number um, or the number on our ID, those numbers don't define us, that's just something about us. Our, our social security number is one thing about us, but it's not everything. The new law has allowed us to broaden that, and I'm just going to share some of the ideas from which we can create a better education system here of what we know makes kids successful in the workforce. Um, one piece of data that I would love uh, the assembly to understand, in research, they found that 70% of students who drop out of high school, they actually say leave high school, the leavers, 70% of them don't move within 10 miles from that high school. So our education, um, I'd say challenge, our charge is everyone's charge, because it's our community, it's our kids in there. Um, we will, and I don't, you know, we will take care of these kids, whether they're working or not, or whether they're achieving or not. Um, they're ours, and so it is better to give them a life, uh, a good life, and hope for their future that they can get a job. So ESSA talks about life-ready skills. Interestingly enough, they talked about grit, perseverance, growth mindset, and being on the social-emotional side is really how to solve problems, um, understanding how to work with people. Uh, we never heard grit before. Uh, grit comes when you fail something, and then you have to try again, and your <coughs> dad doesn't do it for you, your teacher doesn't do it for you. You actually, uh, failing is part of learning, and, and in our lives, um, that, that was like that. When we had to go home and do chores, and we had to do that, and they are discovering that in, um, when we only focused on reading, writing, and math, all those other things that created perseverance and grit went away. They also look at college readiness. They do know that um, there is a relationship between high school GPA and college readiness. There is a relationship there. So we know that we do have to focus on grades with kids and have kids achieving and working towards um, their achievement and their learning. Academic engagement is important. Um, taking courses such as AP, IB, higher level. We are going to start looking at how many of our Alaska Native kids, how many of our African American kids are taking AP courses. When you are ready for an AP course, that doesn't happen, although it's given in 10th and 11th grade. AP starts back in 6th grade with somebody saying, you know how to do this. You are going to take this honors class. You are going to do this. It takes that engagement uh, of the student to understand that that is their line as well. Um, participation and completion in just college preparatory courses, career pathways. Career technical courses are good for everyone, not just kids going to college. They've demonstrated that career tech, as well as activities you'll see in a little bit, mirror employee-employer <coughs> relationships more than the teacher-student does. Did you hear that? Career technical courses, student engagement in them, whether it be CNA, welding, construction, learning, even if they're going to college, that that more mirrors employee-employer than teacher-student. It's true. So, if they want to be work-ready, we know that there's lots of opportunities for careers to get right into apprenticeship, especially in Alaska. Career clusters, attendance is important. <coughs> uh, for career-ready community service, uh, not necessarily because kids are doing things, but community service, connection to your community. Um, you network, you start to understand where the jobs are, and you meet people. Workplace learning experience. Uh, we all have our own culture, if you will, of how we behave um, at home, but there is an idea about a workplace culture of showing up on time, putting your phone away, shaking someone's hand, greeting someone, working with others. Those are things that we need to offer opportunities in our school. And of course, dual credit is good, uh, and organized co curriculums <coughs> that is huge. So when we talk about how we're gonna reduce, one of the things that prepare kids for later on in life our co-curriculars, because it again, mirrors um, real life more than teacher student does. <coughs> our board has challenged us to just redefine what we mean so that we can educate all students for life. And I, that is our mission. We spoke about mission earlier. Um, we are uh, driven by our outcomes now. The cat's out of the bag, the data are there, and we're not gonna live here though. We have um, an opportunity and a challenge to change the learning for kids so that we increase our experiences so that we have um, the best city ever.
very helpful. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was really great. Any um, comments or questions from anyone? Just thoughts from you. Just briefly, I, I, um, this was a long time coming, but I, I really appreciate the, the data focus um, serving on the board. I, we have a fabulous school district um, with a lot of fabulous uh, teachers and other employees. I was surprised when I got on how data averse the district was, how almost data traumatized it was. Um, it, it, uh, I, I think a mixture of ordinary resistance and some where, where data was used uh, sort of uh, as an offensive weapon against teachers <coughs> and schools and label schools failing, that that combination somehow had made the, uh, this district, maybe all districts to some extent, really data diverse. I'm, I'm uh, really hard to see how, how you're confronting it. Um, you know, it is. Um, not something to be hidden, but put out and discussed, and why is this? That we're underachieving here, maybe we're doing great here, but we're underachieving here, and why? And only when you do that uh, in this way can we get real results. Um, I, I sat on a train and became a big Cat and Moffat fan, um, uh, and uh, so the way you're using data, but also the fact that you have a roving data person, right, a roving problem solver, uh, it, it is hard to me, so I, I look for uh, big things. I did not see there, and people that serve with you on the board will, will know that I'll bring this up. I did, I did not see growth as opposed to proficiency. And um, I saw that it, it remains in one of the, the progress goals, but you do what's measured, or whatever that quote is, and I didn't see it as a measurement. It continues to be um, important to me, and so I just wanted to communicate that growth is very different than proficiency. Um, and it took me a while of delving in the data to figure out how important that was. Figuring out, you know, grading how many kids are gonna run an eight minute mile. Uh, some kids came in running an eight minute mile and some kids are never gonna. And you want to move everybody forward. And if you simply measure proficiency or even change in proficiency, which is sometimes misunderstood as growth, you miss the fact that you took somebody who couldn't run at all and got them to a 12 minute mile and that was great. And you took your six minute milers to five and that was great. But that, the, the proficiency measure loses all that. And so um, it's part of your goal still, that's good. It has to be somewhere in the measurements or you teach teachers to only get them to barely proficient and drop it. Um, and and so I urge you to do that, but, uh, but I'm very uh, heartened by being upfront and honest with our data because that's the only way we're able to solve Thank you, Mr. Cross. Um, yes, uh, through the chair to Mr. Cross. Actually, you're, you're absolutely correct, and um, we have, uh, the staff has organized for an assessment called Measures of Academic Progress to be in all middle schools. Middle school is the place you lose ground um, with that, uh, and so, the guarantee in our um, in the board's uh, goals is that you grow a year for year, and that doesn't mean that when I'm in third grade, I grow to fourth grade, and so I'm successful. It means what was I achieving? We can drill down and say this third grader is on a fifth grade math proficiency. So when that third grader leaves third grade with a fifth grade math proficiency, they should start fourth grade with a sixth grade beginning to move forward. So. Um, math assessment demonstrates that. It is uh, on a ROSH unit, and so we actually can determine where kids are, and no matter where they are, they have to have the growth that's for their um, achievement already. And th the math will take and adjust. It doesn't allow you, when a kid steps back on, it's only a 20 minute you know, quick assessment. When they step back on it, they start where they left off. So that you can't go back and say, oh yeah, so it's real dynamic to the child. Some kids take a longer time, some a little. The longer you take on math with a kid, you know that they actually have a higher propensity to learn and at a, at a higher level. So uh, it is key that in data, in closing the gap, that you have to, because you can close the gap the other way, make everybody <laughs> go down. So you have to get guarantee a year for a year, not grade level year, but achievement year, what they're already doing. And then you also have to make up more than a year for kids who are behind. You have to find ways to do that. And technology 
is the, the that is the, the true efficiency for which it is the least expensive um, and, it, and you can train multiple times. So the younger the child is, um, the earlier you have to do it to actually, you, you can't afford what it would take an older child to um, get on grade level. Uh, once or two years behind, that's significant. It's, it's without a whole lot of money, it's hard to do. Um, to get a child getting on grade level by third grade is just repetition. It's things that you have in their home that just needs to get them up there. So it's, it's, um, it's exciting, it's based off of research, and what you said is absolutely correct in that you have to look at the, the, where they are um, so they don't lose it. And all of our middle schools are doing that because we have some kids going into middle school, sixth or seventh grade, that are actually on a ninth grade level. Thank you, Dr. Sorrell. Mr. Train. Parker, on the ESC student behavior fence, can we break that up by type of fence? Because many of these kids are provided to these fences in school will carry the four to when they become adults. So do we know predominantly the type of fence you should be able to use? Through the chair, uh, to Mr. Train, yes. And, and they are defined ideally by about 10 or 12 different defenses. Uh, uh, and, and yes, when the, I can provide you the list. Uh, Today when we get back, but I can also, I wonder if it's showing on there, it's probably not in the picture, um, but on October 10th, this will be uh, public, so you'll actually see all that, but I will provide it to the assembly prior to that time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Mr. Starr. It's a conversation that's going to sound caustic to some, but I, I find that the nature of the conversations where we meet people in the grocery stores or the coffee shop, that's not a disclaimer, it, they, they tend to become prejudiced when we when we move toward that conversation that well there's there's more first Alaskans in that school that's why that school is in trouble or black students or thereabouts and so I need guidance whether it be emails or just general conversation that that's not the reason why as well as the fear factor and you know where I represent you the Eagle River we've got high score numbers and all that the, 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 the other factor that comes into play as well don't take my resources to solve a problem at X and that conversation is very uh, challenging for me to come about because I'm not always certain what the what the driving forces are for both the achievement and the underachiever. And when you blatantly put it in there in ethnicity and race conversations with the first Alaskan native population mixed in there, it seems like we're trending more towards uh, a conversation that be, could, could become a prejudice statement, and I don't know any other better word for that, or, or a, uh, at fault for pulling my school numbers down, not mine, but the area in general. So I'm cautious about that. So the data dashboard, will it have ethnicity, race, and that by school as well? Does it does it summarize that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. So you will be able to see the percentages, but certainly uh, the message from, from us, uh, this is not about intellect. I, I mean, if this was about intellect, I mean, it, it truly is about uh, opportunities and understanding where our kids are and what kind of, what we need to benefit but certainly um, you know that is exactly where we don't want to go we're, we're going to succeed when we all move forward when everybody every if I have a kid for a year they need to learn a year or more and um, you know it, it isn't about that school you know the, those people bring this or this it is all of us this is we are a very diverse place and when all is all of us achieve and so you know, ANSEP is a, an exact example of that, um, the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program. If it was about intellect, then no, I get how, it. How my we my child went there so, and did that yeah. program, but it, it tends to become those conversations. And I'm just looking for how do you get past that that fear? First, you're going to mess with you, yet you're going to you're going to bring down that. You know, and, and it's it was oftentimes well, if we had a better building, Golden View Middle School is not grooming, but the numbers uh, change. So. I need to have that conversation so we can become more collective because we're quite territorial out in our group. Uh, independent would be another word, but uh, we're protective of that as well. As it drifts into the budgetary conversation related to that, we used to see budgetary support developed by school attached to the back of the proposed budget books. And when I dug deep into that, that wasn't always the way it came out. So there was a sort of perception. And, and prove me wrong or not, but the attachments to the budget books was to say we would fund uh, Eagle River High School at you know 1.7 million for this and all that. And then when the final budgets came, the overall funding scheme came into play with either some are better or not. Then we did a rebalancing of that after the public hearings were occurring. Does that happen? Do you, do you know that that still happens? We through the chair, yes. we, um, the practice of, of a 
finding it by school has not happened sometimes on the board. Right. We used to do it that way, and there was a certain expectation that that assembly member or that budgetary function when we amended or, or what we were comfortable with it. But how then do we fund by school to sort of track that progress uh, for achievement as opposed to reducing the score numbers uh, by budgetary driving? You know, pull teachers out, rows, rows out. How, how do we prevent that from a budgetary perspective? Yeah. Um, I, I, there's a few questions and I'm not exactly sure yeah. um, about the achievement part of it, but certainly um, Number of teachers yeah. and class size is usually how okay. it happens. So ESSA, um, the new act, uh, just, it was kind of on hold in a conference committee for quite some time at the federal level, and mm -hmm. the one thing that they um, disagreed on was they, and they finally decided it, I believe, last week, is uh, how schools have to report equity of funding. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, it used to be by FTE, or full-time equivalent. So I have this many teachers at this school, this many teachers at right. this school. But we all know that teachers of different um, uh, levels, masters, are higher than teachers who have a bachelor's. And generally, the longer you're in the system, the more you can navigate to a, a, a school of your choice. Of your choice, newer folks uh, generally take the job that's there. And mm -hmm. generally, jobs in our lower socioeconomic areas are have more openings. That's what happens. So, um, but the new law says that you have to report by. Uh, school by mean of school not so schools are not equal or equitable just because they have the same FTE it has to be by the dollar amount yeah so let me and ask so this are we equipped we, to do we, that we are oh, we're I'm bringing uh, someone is here to that's going to do that our sun guard system will be able to do that the board will be people will be able to see this is how much money per student goes into here now there's quite a few programs that are more expensive if you have a lot of career technical programs in a school be way more expensive. You can only have eight to ten kids in some of those because they're outside party, right. third party regulated, like um, automotive. You're not allowed to have, you know, just for safety reasons. Or um, special services. Uh, if you have a, a deaf ed class, you know, they're probably going to have uh, more adults than kids. Um, so there are some other indicators that they're trying. But maybe to those are secrets to success. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. know. The so FTE conversation is helpful to have. I didn't mean to interrupt, but the the last thing that happens is that lending after the budgets are approved, and I know that that's occurred in the past. And so we have to be careful that it doesn't happen the again. The federal regulations are going to force okay. the opposite of what you're talking about. So will that happen this budget cycle? Do you think? You know what? Um, it's happening for us because I a board member said I want to know, and I said, well, I was surprised that they didn't know, but I said oh, I will get this for you. So um, uh, we can do that now, um, more work for Andy, you know, but our system, we're, we're, we're increasing our, our sign guard system to be able to do that automatically, uh, but the state will require once all those uh, regulations are put in place um, at the feds, they'll trickle down to us and we'll have to start um, through that. Will it uh, be actually, on there? Yeah, and then it'll be on the deep website as well. When, when do you think that will happen? I bet um, they'll make it for FY18 next year. Not, not launched at your October 10th uh, summary by school. No, we will have it. The board will have that. The, the board uh, in October will have by school uh, finances. I would like that too. Thank you. I Thanks. see your hand, but Mr. Peterson is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, I, I think the that dashboard uh, and the information you have here is uh, going to help you a lot. It'll help you find out what you don't know. If you, if you do the drilling down and you're talking about it, I can see that being a very, very useful tool. But my question is, I've always have a hard time imagining how can kids only have slightly over 50% attendance? That makes absolutely no sense to me. I was perfect attendance kind of guy. And so people that are only showing up half the time, do, do we have information on why they don't show up more often? And, and how, if, if you're not in school, it's hard to learn. And you can see the statistics, the group that have 90% attendance, are the kids that are getting fewer apps. So but that wasn't 50% attendance. That was 50% who got to 90, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So how many students were at 90% attendance? Still a good point, but it just it wasn't, yeah. they were gone half the time. Right. But, so it, anyway, it, do we have more information or can we get more information about why, why the kids just don't show up? I'll explain it to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Evans? Uh, yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I, going to these meetings for like two and a half years, I don't think I've said two things. Um, for the most part, it's just, I'm not interested. Um, <laughs> well, no, I'm serious because, I mean, I, I, I really believe that, you know, public education, not only in Anchorage, but everywhere, uh, is in need of a, of a revolution. I said that before, um, much more fundamental change than, we're 
talking about, and most of the things we talk about in these meetings, you know, you know, whether high school kids come to school earlier or later, it's like discussing, you know, what color paint you're going to put on the walls. And get, so I just sit there and, you know, kind of take it all in and let, I'm glad that other people are, you know, working on it. Um, <coughs> but this presentation, uh, I was interested in. Uh, this is the first thing I've heard uh, in the last, since I've been going to these meetings, uh, that not only gave me confidence that we were kind of going in a better direction, uh, but that it was the right direction to go in. I mean, I, I think, I still think it's too small, I still want my revolution, but um, I'm really impressed that you're digging into this level and seem to be uh, motivated to do something about it once you get the data. Um, so it, it's, it's just a way to say that uh, I congratulate the school board on what seems to me to be a very good hire for superintendent. Thank you, Mr. I just wanted to add a couple of things to what we've been talking about. One of the things that we face in the school district is our transient rate. We have some schools that are 40 to 50 percent of their kids are transient, which means they might be there two weeks, they might be there two months, and then they're gone. So, and they might move to another school, they might move to another district, they might go back out to the village. So, that's really hard to. Uh, when we talk about proficiencies and such, you know, we have to include those numbers at the in October, and so that's part of those numbers. But when you've got a transient rate of that magnitude, it it does kind of screw screw. I can't say that skew. anyway. Screw it. Anyway, those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The other thing, both things. Uh, the other thing is um, prison the, the pipeline. We we've heard it all. The prison the pipeline that any child that is suspended has an increased risk of becoming involved in the juvenile system or the uh, um, incarcerated. So one of the things I think that we've done a poor job in the past, and I'm excited that we are looking at this, is we have suspended uh, children for willful disobedience. We have suspended kids because they kicked the door. Um, we have suspended kids because maybe they said a profanity. So the answer has been, take them out of school because we don't want them in the classroom. That's not the answer. The answer is, how do we address that child's need? How do we, maybe there's a conflict between the teacher and child. We've never even sat down and talked about it. So we are looking at different ways to help those children be successful, keep them in the classroom, because that does affect our graduation rate, it does affect our attendance rate. And so those are things that I'm very happy that uh, the school district is looking at how we're going to change uh, that whole suspension and what it looks like. Thank you, Ms. Marcet. Mr. Buster, Ms. Yes, I just want to clarify for Mr. Stark, the data dashboard that's coming out um, hasn't been set up to put those financial pieces in there. It's, mm -hmm. it's more geared toward the academic achievement attendance. However, I am hoping that as we <coughs> our budget this year, that that information will be provided. So, but it, at this point, it's not built into the DAP dashboard. Thank you, Mr. Gosser. Mr. Bus. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to echo things that Mr. Croft said and Mr. Evans. I'll just say, you know, purple. Because my greatest frustration um, has been consistently, where's the data? What is the data telling us? And how do you utilize that data to get the best uh, education and return on our investment? And this is the very first time I actually feel like we have leadership that has listened. I hate to say it like that, but um, I know when I talk, and it's not, I'm not talking about the school board, I'm talking about actually somebody who's not afraid of the data. That's what I'm talking about. You know, somebody's not gonna take the data and teach the children to stick because we're not getting the results we want. And, and I love the fact that somebody, we have leadership now that comes in and says, okay, well, what does it tell us? It's an opportunity for all of us to do better for our kids. Um, I know I talked uh, extensively with Madison School Board members and legislators prior to uh, the hire, and um, I'm happy to say um, I haven't been let down thus far. So <laughs> I'm very, I'm very enthusiastic. I think this is the first time. This gives us hope. And as everybody has said, this is an opportunity to have a community discussion. So however it is, we need to shift resources. We need to change things. We need to be more um, helpful. I'm excited to do that. And. Um, I just, I learned a lot today, and I can tell uh, the school board is really holding uh, Dr. Caramo's feet to the fire and has given real direction that you guys want to change. And I think we're right there with you, and we just really appreciate your leadership and your willingness to keep the data to the public and to um, learn from it and to blaze a path so our kids are the best in the nation. Thank you, Ms. Kambowski. I don't see any other, any other hands, but I'm not going to say this was an excellent, excellent presentation. Is, is your hand up? Yes. 
I would just say that the changes that we've seen in, in fairness to, uh, and I appreciate your comment, uh, is, is not so much <coughs> the board holding Dr. Framo feet to the fire. At the very first board meeting, we had this presentation uh, from Dr. Framo. Uh, the leadership role here is, is there. The, the, I've always been on the board, the most important thing that you do is hiring the superintendent. That's the most important thing the board does. So we take, I agree with uh, Mr. Evans, I, I take a lot of pride in, in the selection we did. But we do have that being led with the board. We've always wanted this, we haven't been getting it, but we've got a new day, and I am just uh, tickled pink with it. So I just want to, uh, there's, a, there's a role here that Dr. Bremer does a great job of recognizing the board, and I appreciate that, but it, it's a two way street. She, it's just fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. That's your thought? No, it's just showing Pat how to raise his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Fogg. Yeah, I, I just want to do a shout out to our chief information officer and his staff because this is a result of very, very hard and creative work on their behalf. And so I want to make sure the kudos are shared. Uh, yes, the leadership is important. And uh, I, I can tell you, as a former classroom teacher, where I got student test scores like in the fall after I didn't have the students anymore, the data didn't really help me. And so this, uh, you know, on time, uh, like I, I have, you can get reports, this is great, you can get reports sent to you, you can subscribe to certain reports. So every Monday morning after the uh, attendance data is updated, I get a report sent to me on the attendance for the whole Anchorage School District. So you can, uh, you know, have your, your alerts and all types of great things, use of technology. So the, the ability to do this, I think teachers and staff have always wanted to be able to utilize this data. We just didn't have the resources to, to be able to make that um, easily accessible. And so people are very excited. I, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm a former classroom teacher. I have many people in the trenches and they're talking about, you know, oh, this is, this is what I learned and, and hmm, that doesn't work. So what do I need to do differently in order to, to change the outcome? And that's the type of uh, discussion as a board member I'm very, very Thank you, Mr. Goshen. Mr. Wells. Uh, you know, the data is really good. The most important data to probably most of us to be today is the angle. And, and it's one kid down to one in the school district, and I want to see how he's doing right now because I got to stay on him every day. And it's very valuable when it's kept up to date. But when the teachers don't use it and we're relying on it, um, it it's a problem. So, and I think it, it depends on the teacher. But if you encourage the teacher, going to provide Zango, keep it up to date, because I'll look at this maybe twice a year, but I look at his every single day. <laughs> Very so thank you, Mr. We actually are uh, reviewing uh, grading practices to where it will become a requirement and something that um, is done, because it's the value on the outside um, of every, and probably more kids use Zango now than adults, because they check their own stuff. So. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. The last big one, I just want to piggyback on what Mr. Wells just said, because I have junior. And when you were talking about zeros and how they can make a grade, I mean, that's my golden rule is if I see a good day, you know, all bets are off. So, I Zangle is a huge resource for parents because my kids check, I check it, I think once or twice a week, once, a twice, once a week or once every two weeks, but my son checks it every day because he wants to make sure there's no <laughs> So, um, you know, as a parent, I'm sure there's a lot of parents like Mr. Wells and, and myself that, you know, we really, that's what I'm request that you know, I have as a parent that, you, you know, that those grades are updated because it, it doesn't help after the fact. But if, if we know you missed an assignment three days ago, what's what's going on here? Thank you, Mr. Brodsky. We're gonna skip member comments, just kidding. <laughs> We're at number seven, member comments. Any other comments from anyone? Okay, um, audience participation. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Jones. Hi, thank you. Um, Ms. Gray Jackson, I'd like to um, ask Deputy Clerk Amanda Moser to make an announcement. I think we've um, beat you all with a dead horse about the announcements about parking day today. And unfortunately, as many announcements as I sent, I couldn't get the weather to cooperate. But in spite of that, it is parking day, and I'd like Amanda to make an announcement and give you some information about that. Thank you, Ms. Jones. So much. Thank you for this opportunity. Parking Day is an annual worldwide event that allows parking spaces to be transformed into parks. And so the Parks and Rec Department has been working hard to transform half of the back lot into a park. And it's got food trucks, it's got a farmer's market, so you can get some fresh.
fresh Alaskan grown produce for your weekend meals. Um, we encourage everyone to stop by and enjoy this beautiful green space. And we've made little um, name tags for the school board members and the assembly members and the parks department has provided beautiful little uh, flowers to wear as you go out and enjoy the green space so folks can see our elected officials as you're out there. So we do encourage you to enjoy this uh, excellent opportunity. It is a little rainy, but there's plenty of covering. So if you do decide to get some heat, you'll be able to sit at a picnic table under uh, tent. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Moser. Anyone in the audience would like to make a comment or? Okay. Our next meeting is going to be Friday, December 9th from 10 to 12 p.m. at the Agency Education Center Board Room, which is on Northern Lights Boulevard. May I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Thank you.